Hey guys, it's Colin again. Hey, I missed you this week, and I hope what happened to me didn't happen to you. So I was putting laundry away in my laundry hamper, just like I would do every single day. And I opened up the top of my laundry hamper to put clothes in there. And as I opened it, a bug fell off the top of it, fell on the ground, started scurrying around the on, around on the ground. It, this thing was fast. So I had to chase it. And I stomped it a bunch of times with my sandal on. And I had bare feet. So I was like, oh, it's blood and guts are going to get on my feet. So I look a little closer and I'm going to show you a picture of this bug. It was really really gross. And I told my roommate about it and I wasn't sure if it was a centipede or if it was a millipede. And maybe you know, but I didn't know. So I did some more research. I went to Orkin's website and Terminex. They're like bug killers. And so I went to their websites and tried to figure out what the difference is between a centipede and a millipede. I learned a few things. None of them made me feel a whole lot better. So a centipede is a carnivore. Yeah. So that means that if there are more of these centipedes around my room, it's possible that they could eat me to avenge the death of the centipede friend of theirs that I killed. So that didn't make me feel really good. A millipede, on the other hand, is what's called a detritivore. Didn't know what that was either, but they feast on decayed plant and animal matter. That didn't make me feel any better either because I was like, well, if the centipedes kill me and leave some of my body there, then the millipedes will come and eat my decaying body. I was like, okay, that's not going to be good either. Then I, some, one thing did make me feel a little bit better, and that is that when a millipede is in defense mode, it feels like it's being attacked, it will curl up into a cute little ball. It's like, oh, okay, that's kind of, you know, cute and playful, like a little, you know, teddy bear. A, a, a centipede, on the other hand, will inject venom into its enemy. Thankfully, I don't think I've had any venom injected into me, but these things are dangerous. And then uh, there's one thing that helps me definitively know the difference between a centipede and a millipede. And I'm going to show you the picture that I found on Terminex's website. So based on this picture, it looks like millipedes have two pairs of legs per body segment, whereas a centipede has only one pair of legs per body segment. Both of them are really gross, but I knew in the end that I definitely had a centipede on my hands. Now, this was not the end of my worries because I went outside my room to get a paper towel and I was going to bring the paper towel back, pick up the dead centipede and go and throw it in the garbage like you'd normally do. Well, while I was out of my room, I got a little bit distracted, forgot what I was doing. Then I had to leave and go to my parents' house, came back a few hours later, the centipede was gone. So I went to my roommate and I was like, Dan, and you met Dan in the last video. Dan, did you happen to vacuum my room for some reason? He's like, no. So then I realized, wait a second. It's possible that that centipede that I had stomped a million times, I thought I had shown it who's boss, that that centipede was actually not dead? There's no possible way. You saw the picture. It looked pretty dead to me. But then I realized, wait a second. If the centipede was dead and it didn't move on its own, then some other bug grabbed it and either ate it right there or hauled it away and was strong enough and big enough to eat it or haul it away. And then I started thinking, well, how big is this other bug that possibly ate the centipede that I killed or dragged it away? And I realized, wait a second, what's happening in my brain right now is I am fearing something that I can't see, that I can't measure, and because I can't measure it either, it's getting bigger and bigger in my head, and I can't control. Those are a few factors that add up to what I now know is worry. I was spending a lot of time worrying about this darn bug and what happened to it. Now, for you, maybe there are some worries that are swirling around in your mind and they're totally justified. You know, worries about coronavirus. Will will I get sick? Will how how sick might I get if I do get it? How you know, would I spread it accidentally to people that I love, my parents or someone else, my siblings? Uh and then maybe your parents are worried about financial things. Maybe uh with things going on in the economy, there's fear of job loss or worry about being able to make uh, the next mortgage payment. These are totally normal worries to have in this crazy situation that we're all in. But worry, all it does is it makes us miserable. And maybe you've experienced it. And it, and it paralyzes our ability to make decisions. And it, uh, it causes us to not be able to fully enjoy the blessings that we have in life, that God has given us. And it prevents us from experiencing real 
rest. And so the question is, how do we stop our worries from growing so big that they consume us? How do we find rest in the midst of an otherwise pretty worrisome circumstance that we all kind of find ourselves in? Well, I'm going to share with you four keys to finding rest in the midst of worry, four secrets to minimizing our worries, but actually these keys have nothing to do with shrinking the actual size or intensity of the things that are going wrong and worrying us. I'll explain a little bit more what I mean. We can learn a lot about dealing with worry, about dealing with worrisome situations from a guy in the Bible named Joshua. And so I want to share with you how he found rest in the midst of what should have been a pretty worrisome uh, set of circumstances. So uh, in the Old Testament, God uses a guy named Moses to help lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and he promises to bring the Israelites to a land that was going to be all their own. The problem is the Israelites didn't obey God. They didn't trust God. They wandered around in the desert for uh, decades. And before they enter the promised land, they haven't yet entered the promised land. And a guy named, uh, well, and Moses, before they ever reach the promised land, Moses, their leader, dies. So that was pretty worrisome. And then this guy named Joshua is installed as the new leader. Imagine being Joshua taking over for Moses. And Joshua was expected to lead the Israelites over the Jordan River, crossing the Jordan River, which was going to be scary and worrisome. And they were going to have to fight battles and, and defeat enemies in order to take the land that God had promised to them. So it was, it was pretty scary, pretty worrisome circumstances for most people. So here is the pep talk, if you will, that God himself gives to Joshua in the midst of all these worries. And we see it in Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says, God says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you Go. Okay, so here are the four keys to overcoming worry, to finding rest in the midst of worrisome circumstances. Four keys, and they actually spell out the word rest, R-E-S-T. The first one that I see based on what God tells Joshua here, number one, the R, read your Bible. I think for a lot of us, we spend so much time trying to figure out and overcome and minimize our worries on our own, and it doesn't really work. Our natural tendency is kind of just cause us to make our worries bigger in our own heads, kind of like I did related to the bug that I thought had killed and or had uh, had eaten and pulled away the centipede. It got bigger and bigger in my head and that happens. We need to look to God's opinion because he has the key to finding rest. He has the key to overcoming worry. Let's see what God says about finding rest in the midst of worrisome circumstances. The second letter, so we've got read your Bible. The E is every day and night. And the way that I see that is in verse 8. Look at this. God says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Guys, kind of the, the blessing in disguise of being in this quarantine, the stay-at-home order that the governor just just issues, we're going we're, we're gonna to be in this situation for a couple weeks. That means that we're going to have more time on our hands than we ever have before. There's really no reason not to invest that time wisely because we've got plenty of it. Spend time diving in to God's Word. Okay, so the, the third letter, we've got read your Bible, we've got every day and night. The S is start obeying it. And the way that I see that is in verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. 
Do not turn from, from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Guys, in, in, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we have very little control over a lot of it, right? We couldn't control that our school got moved to online. We can't control that the governor has issued this stay-at-home order that causes us to stay at home unless there are very special circumstances. We can't control the fact that the coronavirus spread to the United States. I mean, there's so little that is in our control, but what you can control is whether or not you obey God's commands. So obey God's commands because that much you can control. And then the T, we got the R, E, S, and then the T is trust his promises. Look at verse five. God says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I think it's really interesting that nowhere in this does God promise to make the problems go away, to make the worries go away. He doesn't do anything that suggests that he's going to um, not allow us to experience opposition or difficulty in our lives. But what he promises us is that he's going to be with us. And that's all we need to know in order to have rest. We just need to trust that promise that he's going to be with us no matter what. And so here's the bottom line today, guys. I want us to remember this. Our worries will seem smaller as our trust in God gets bigger. Our worries will seem smaller as our trust in God gets bigger. Look at Joshua. He was dealing with some circumstances that would definitely worry me. Maybe it would worry you. It would worry a lot of us. He had a lot on his plate, a lot of pressure. He was leading this, this huge group of people who, who are still wandering, who were, who were fearful, who were disobedient. But because of his leadership, Joshua was able to lead the Israelites across the Jordan safely. He was able to lead them to defeat their enemies because he trusted God. And he encouraged the Israelite people and led them well and caused them to trust God as well. And we see toward the end of that, all those battles that they had to, to, um, to endure in order to get that promised land. This is what we read in Joshua 11, verse 23. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. Guys, Joshua and the Israelite people were able to experience rest because they trusted God. And I promise you that if you trust God, he will give you that same rest. Can I pray for you before you head to your discussion time? God, we thank you so much that you love us, that you're in control over the situation that we don't have control over. We, we try to control it and it causes us to worry. It's something that we can't see, we can't control, we can't measure. And so our worries and fears just tend to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But God, thank you that if we simply read your word every day and night, start obeying it and trust your promises, that you will give us rest from our worry. We pray that you would help us to experience that rest as we do those four things this week. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Have a great week, guys.